when Tina um, uh, asked me to do this, I asked her, um, is there anything that she think would make a good subject for a talk? Um, and she told me she was actually in a bit of a funk that day because she had had some frustrating conversations about some projects. And she said, why don't you, um, uh, maybe you could talk, um, talk about clients. And I, I actually, um, clients don't get discussed that much, r really, when designers are talking about their work. Usually, um, they're, you know, there are war stories. Any of you guys here uh, a couple nights ago for that AIJ New York thing? That was, okay, you know, so that's, I, I, I love that kind of conversation, these horrible clients and how they stop you from doing what you want to do, right? <laughs> um, you know, but let's really talk about them. And I told Tina that what I would do is just try to um, uh, tell everything I've learned about clients in the 30 years I've been working as a designer um, professionally here in New York. You know, if uh, in school, you, you really don't have clients. You can pretend your teachers are clients, or sometimes they kind of make up these little projects where someone from the outside is like a pretend client for you. Um, but really, you don't start to engage with these real clients until you um, graduate and work professionally. And the education you get from them is tough and unforgiving and sometimes can actually um, you know, make you as a designer or one false move ruin you as a designer. I've seen it go both ways. Um, but they're really the difference between, I think, they're one of the differences between being an artist where, in my fantasy, uh, you just simply go up to a garret and kind of paint whatever is pour your soul out onto the canvas and uh, uh, the marketplace and then future art historians are your only real judge. Um, if you're a designer, um, you're doing something for a reason. Uh, unless you're independently wealthy or have a source of funding that uh, um, permits you to kind of just concoct ideas by yourself and put them out there, you're probably working in concert with uh, someone else. And I think there's this myth among designers that that sort of is, you know, one of the last kind of uh, unfortunate obstacles to design really being great. We all want to like be our own client or figure out how we can work with our clients. So every time I go to Starbucks and log on, um, you know, I get to, I'm invited to watch uh, uh, the infinitely more uh, entertaining presenter, Stefan Sagmeister, uh, tell us about his year without clients in Bali. I would go insane uh, trying to work in a place like Bali without clients. I simply wouldn't do it. I really wouldn't. I just, I really need um, clients to, um, uh, to kind of provoke me as a designer to do work. And I actually think that clients in many ways can be the best part of the process. One of the things that I've noticed uh, is true about good designers is that they tend to respond really avidly, not necessarily to every client, but they, their, their goal in life is to get excited by what their clients are interested in. And um, it took me a while to figure this out. I was years into my career when I realized that my work was so much better when I was interested in the same thing that the client was interested in. You know, I, I, I would go to the meeting and it was, you know, it was exciting. I'd get like text for the brochure and I'd read it. You know, I sort of could pretend, and it doesn't necessarily mean that it's a, sometimes it's something I don't know anything about. It can be about nuclear disarmament, it can be about professional football, two things I knew very little about when I started working on projects involving those subjects. But I got interested in them and enthusiastic about them and um, momentarily at certain times could even appear to be an expert on the subject. Um, but um, then, other, then there's certain things that I just have a blind spot about like most financial services operations and stuff like that. I sort of don't get what it is, how it works. And it turns out I was right, actually. But uh, <laughs> that's another story. Um, you know, no one did, and that's why uh, we're in the middle of a worldwide recession right now. Um, but, um, but I contributed very little to that recession because I uh, never understood anything about financial services, so I never got into it. Maybe, the, maybe um, uh, one of the problems with uh, the world of uh, uh, derivatives and uh, uh, d you know default credit swaps is that not enough designers were involved with them who could have explained them to people to the point where they'd realize something's wrong with these things. Um, but that's another story and an invitation to all you guys to perhaps uh, uh, think about doing that once, uh, uh, once the economy revs up again, as it seems to be doing now. But I do think that clients can really be the best part of the process. And I want to say one last thing. This is really, really important. You heard, um, uh, you sort of intimated from Tina's introduction that I'm like I'm a famous designer, you know, stuff in museums and whatnot. I promise you that my clients are exactly the same as any of your clients. Um, they're um, they run they run the same gamut. 
um, that, that human beings do. Some of them are really smart and really nice and, some, and, and bad clients. Some of them are assholes and they can be good clients. Sometimes they're impatient and work really fast. Sometimes they lolle around. Sometimes they waste your time. Sometimes they do this. It's the same blend of people. And you know, I, I work at uh, um, Pentagram, and you know, you know, a lot of times people think, oh, no one would even come to Pentagram unless they were sort of pre pre qualified themselves as a client who's worthy of entering our doors. That ain't true at all. <laughs> All kinds of people show up, and even if they're momentarily impressed by Pentagram, once they actually start working on the project, they just turn into whatever jerk they were going to be anyway. And you know, there's no, there's no kind of special thing. So I promise you, um, you know, overall, there's like no guarantee that you know any typical client of mine is any better or any worse than any typical client of yours. However, you can actually, um, as I've gone along, I've tried to actually make my clients be better, sort of, and I'll explain to you some of the things I've learned doing that. So um, um, I remember very early on in my career, um, there was a, um, we had a, I was working, I worked for 10 years for a guy named Massimo Vignelli, starting out as like the lowest person in the office, and after 10 years, because everyone above me just gradually quit over that period, I was sort of like the top graphic designer after 10 years. It takes 10 years, so he has to be patient, but uh, um, I clawed my way up that ladder. Uh, or fell backwards up that ladder. Um, and I remember early on there was a, um, uh, uh, a client, a, a woman that I'll mention later, who, um, uh, who, who we knew, she was a freelance PR person. And we happened at the time to get a big client who was doing this big project. And, um, um, and they sort of were looking to hire a, a, a marketing director, but they didn't have one yet, so we would meet with other people there. And I remember two things about that client. If you called them on the phone, they would play music on hold that was like Muzak on hold, like really creepy kind of 1001 strings, not, iron not with irony either, kind of this horrible sappy kind of violin music, right? And, um, and so like, I'd be on hold like thinking, well, I'm going to have a conversation about design, but I'm listening to, you know, Montevani or Gilbert O'Sullivan or whoever I was listening to then. And, um, <clears throat> and then um, if you go to the office, the the furniture in the little waiting room was like not good but you know that's okay they were like starting up and they don't need fancy furniture but they had this fake ficus tree kind of a wilting fake ficus tree it's hard like an unhealthy it was fake and it didn't look like it was doing too well as a you know so it was like no one had like given it fake water in a long time it just looked sad and and i remember thinking it was it really sort of like you know you'd go and try to have these conversations about you know Design, not just aesthetics, but judgment and business plans. And you just wonder, you know, between the um, uh, this music and uh, this tree, you know, you know, what hope did we have actually? And finally, they hired a um, uh, uh, they hired someone to be the marketing director. And they hired this person that we knew, kind of uh, um, who we already knew who and liked. And um, the next time I called, that music was gone, and there was like decent classical music, like Vivaldi or Bach or something. And the next time I went to that office, the chairs were straightened up, the stupid fake paintings were off the wall, and that fucking tree was gone. <laughs> and I said, um, I said, what happened to the tree? And uh, my client said, oh, that piece of crap. I threw that out like, before I took my coat off. And I'm like, <laughs> well done. So, you know, um, if, 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 if she, you know, she didn't ask anyone's permission. She, you know, and, and why do you have to? Why is that important? You know, she didn't have to, you know, she just decided not to explain it. She just said, we're going to get rid of that tree. Okay, I'll take it out. And so uh, the tree was gone, the music was changed. And that turned into a, a really um, great client, actually, uh, because those signifiers actually meant something. Um, on the other hand, she was uh, um, one of these one kind of good client. My best clients have always been ones that either loved design, which she did, or I've, got, I've had clients who I really liked who just didn't give a damn about design, just didn't care about design. Um, you know, just sort of like I'd come in, I'd sort of explain, um, you know, I'd, get, I'd figure out what the brief was, I'd come in and they'd say, okay, good, that's fine, goodbye, thank you. Uh, go ahead and do that, knock yourself out. 
um, don't spend too much money and just get it done, you know, uh, according to whatever budget so-and-so will give you. Um, the worst kinds are, are the ones in between, you know, the ones that are really interested in design but don't really know about it, the ones that are interested in it but they're sort of afraid of it, the ones that are um, know about it but sort of have, have like read about things like certain orange juice packaging that kind of went wrong and they're determined, you know, not to have that happen on their watch, you know. Those ones are problems. And so uh, I've actually... Um, Sometimes they say you have to work with the very top person in an organization. That's not true. It doesn't have to be the boss. It can be anyone anywhere along. But the thing that they, ha they have to somehow um, feel confident enough in their abilities and their judgment and confident enough in your judgment that they'll just let you do what, what you can do. And it can be, it can be like a, an ambitious junior marketing person. It could be the owner of the company. It can be anyone. But it's those in-between people that kind of like... A, uh, don't care about, you know, who care about design just enough to worry about it and then to drive you crazy that ends up being the problem. Um, despite all that, I never, ever talk about educating the client. I hate that phrase. I just hate it. Um, I actually don't, I've never met a client that I thought needed educating or that I thought I was capable of educating. I always thought that every time there was a flawed client relationship, it was because I was insufficiently educated about what it was that client was about, right? That client's job isn't to know about design. That client's, the client's job is to run their business or run the institution or to kind of establish the goals that they're going after for uh, whatever they're coming to work for every day. My job is to worry about the design part. You know, their job is just to like figure out you know, um, just enough to, to know, um, you know, how much I can help and just trust me to let them help them. So I, you know, so for instance, because I don't, I, I never try to educate the client. Um, people who have been in meetings with me will, will vouch for this. I will, like, I do anything to avoid talking about typefaces, white space, you know, composition on pages, and worst of all, colors. I hate talking about colors. Um, I, avoid, I do anything I can to talk about this stuff, and if the subject comes up, I act as if, like, oh, uh, well, you know, if you, you know, I act like that's, that's, a, that's a really nerdy thing that normal people really, that civilized people shouldn't be discussing, you know, um, you know, during business hours. You know, we should, you know, if you, you have a, you know, meet there for a beer and I'll tell you about fonts, you know, but I mean, in a meeting, what does it matter whether it's, um, you know, Mrs. Eves or Baskerville or Bedoni, they're all just letters with feet on them, right? I, you know, I don't, do I believe that? No, of course, I fret about these things hours on end. But, I, but if you play, if you do it right, you're not really, you know, you, the conversation you have in a meeting with a client is 99% about their business and their goals and 1% about, you know, the, these esoteric tools that we as graphic designers have at our disposal to help them achieve those goals, if you ask me. Um, so what makes a really good client? And this has been the hardest part of my career trying to kind of put together a profile. Like, you know, you know how they profile potential terrorists so you can tell by looking at them when they're arriving at the airport? I do that with clients, kind of profiling to, for potential terrorist clients so I can kind of like put them off to the side and put them on my watch list and not work with them. And I, I, I used to be really bad at it because I just was so happy that anyone at all would work with me, but now I've sort of noticed that that, I used to think that was the only qualification that uh, um, anyone had to have was the wisdom to ask me to help them. Uh, do their work, but uh, now I realize that that's it's not true. So, I mean, there are really four things that I like. Um, the first thing is brains. Uh, Tibor Coleman one time said, you never go wrong if you hire, if you work with people that are smarter than you. He meant employees and he meant especially clients. And I think that's really true. If I, the minute I have a client who I think is smarter than me, I get really excited. The minute I have a client that I think is dumber than me, I get worried. Um, passion is important too. And th the passion, again, doesn't have to be about design. The passion has to be about whatever it is that's bringing them to work every day. If you're working with people that are just there um, to work from 9 to 5, collect a paycheck, and wait and have a barbecue on Saturday and watch the big game, these are all perfectly fine things to do that a large mass of the working public do every week. Um, but they, they tend not to make good clients because they get impatient when you sort of come back a third time with that thing or you think you've made it a little bit better where they've already kind of said yes to the second thing, right? So you need people that are passionate, that'll be passionate about the thing that, that'll sort of mirror the passion that you have about your work with the passion they have about their work. Um, and then trust, of course, is important. You know, if you can... I think most of you have thought about it. You've thought about clients you really liked working with. The thing that really stands out uh, um, in their personality profile is that they just somehow trust you. You know, they, if, you, if you make, because you know, you're making these suggestions most of the time that you can't prove the way that a lot of business 
advice can be proven. You can't take, take out a calculator and say that uh, this thing will be, will be better because it's this PMS color or that PMS color. And clients who sort of uh, are a little trust deficient tend to be overly reliant on um, focus groups and market testing and things like that. Things that all have their place, but things that actually can't really be the drivers of processes. And so that trust thing's really important. And finally, courage. And courage, I don't mean sort of a, you know, damn everyone, I'm gonna force this fantastic design through, I don't care what anyone says. I don't, to me, the, you know, I, those people kind of scare me. I just don't, I don't wanna be making any, I, I like to kind of slide through and not, you know, just get my thing done and not make any big scenes. So big stands that require courage with a capital C alarm me faintly. But what I do like is I, I had a, another client who, if I was in a meeting with him, I'd be, I'd, I'd be with him and some other guys. I'd have something on a table. We put it out there. And then um, someone at the, you know, one of his underlings would say, or not even one of his underlings, one of his superiors might say, you know, um, oh, yeah, but I see that you're proposing to do that. And uh, Bob in operations said that that was a problem because the last time they did that, that thing didn't work out so well. And um, in a normal average meeting, everyone would write this down, like, you know, Bob doesn't like, you know, kind of thing Bob doesn't like, you know, watch out. And then you get a memo saying, um, uh, be careful about doing that thing because um, certain stakeholders are concerned about, you know, so, um, and, said, and said he would say, really, why? And then the person would say, oh, I don't know, I wasn't in the meeting, I just heard Bob didn't like it. Then, um, and then, he, then I remember my client would do this all the time. He'd say, give me a phone. Then he'd, then he'd say, um, hey, is Bob in? And then he'd just be on the phone with Bob and say, Bob, what's this thing about the, you know. And he just would talk to him right then and there. Then he'd say, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh -huh, and hang up, and he'd say, oh, this is what it is. Explain it, done, bang. Is that courage? It's not the kind of courage it takes to, you know, wipe out a foxhole worth of enemy combatants, exactly or to hit the beach at uh, Omaha on D-Day. But in business, there's, no matter how little courage it takes to do that, most of the people I, I know in corporations particularly don't have that courage. They just think, you know, this is only going to end in tears. I could get in trouble for this. I'm like jumping over my authority. I'm just calling attention to myself. And they won't do it. But this guy did, and my favorite clients all tend to do that. Um, OK, so all that said, um, just because I say someone is a great client, they may not be, that same person might not be a great client for you. And if you have a great client, that great client might not be a good client for me. Um, I know this well because um, I, at Pentagram, I have um, uh, uh, 15 partners. I have six partners in our New York office, and sometimes we'll trade and share clients. And, uh, and there are certain clients that uh, will work well with any partner. There are other clients that just have a particular chemistry with one of the partners, and I think that's true with designers, too, is that it is sort of like this two-way street, that somehow all these characteristics, the, you know, particularly the trust, I think, but uh, you know, the passion and the courage to a certain degree, are all sort of symbiotic and are kind of developed in tandem with the designer that they work with. So there's a couple of people that I would name as my favorite designers of all times where, um, uh, I literally had someone say to me, I, you know, I was thrown in a meeting with this horrible person who said that they knew you, and it'll turn out to be one of my favorite clients. And they'll describe, and they'll describe how horrible they are. They'll say, they just picked up the phone in the middle of a meeting, we're calling people. You know, like, and it's like things, oh, I love that, you know, but uh, not everyone loves the same thing, you know. <clears throat> okay, so this is what I learned from Massimo Vignelli, and this is absolutely true. If you have good clients, if you do work, good work for good clients, it will lead to more good work for other good clients. If you do bad work for bad clients, it will lead to more bad work for other bad clients. So you can do as much bad work for as many bad clients as you want, but you have to realize that it is not going, that no matter what anyone says, you know, it won't lead to doing good work. Only good work leads to more good work. It's not so obvious, right? But I can't tell you how many times I'm like tempted to do a job. Sometimes you do, you know, all of us one time or another, unless we're incredibly lucky, will be in a situation where you bite your tongue and think, you know, I'm going to do this just for the money. And of course, the money's never enough by the time you've been doing it for a while. No matter how much they said they're going to pay you, if you really make that deal, it sort of somehow doesn't seem to be enough to justify. But that's another story. Um, but um, one thing I won't leave, it's not like, um, you know, I'll do this crappy job. You know, I want to do, um, 
I, want, I really want to do exhibition design, say I've never done it before, and I've got this offer to do this crappy exhibit for this, about this stupid subject for someone I don't like. But if I do that, I'll sort of at least get my foot in the door and do a little bit of exhibition design. That will lead to more things. No, it won't. It'll lead to more horrible exhibits for even worse people. It, it, so said Massimo, I didn't believe him, but I've actually seen this played out over and over again in 30 years. So um, the whole trick is to try to just do good things for good people. Um, here's the problem, though is that all of us have this range of clients, and some of them are really good, some of them are not so good. And part of the trick is that the bad clients take up more time than they should, because they're the ones who say, we're not sure, do it 12 other ways. Um, that thing we decided last time we changed our mind about, come to a new meeting, and we'll tell you the new thing we decided before we change our mind again. Um, that thing that I sent you that was complete actually left out a lot of stuff and now here's that new information that, I, that no one told you about that has to be incorporated that renders the previous solution that came up with obsolete. These are all things bad clients do and they all do, among, among other things like driving you insane, they all also just take more time. Meanwhile, the good clients, like, it's so easy to take them for granted. You know, they don't get pissy if you don't call them back right away. Um, they're really efficient in the way they work. And I've just learned that the trick is to somehow reverse those two things, to lavish time on the good clients and to try to minimize the time on the bad clients. And there was, I had an epiphany um, uh, a little more than um, eight years ago. Um, it was tied to, um, it was tied to um, uh, September 11th back in 2001. And this is like a, a, a a trivial, petty little thing that I realized afterwards. But you know, every you know, all of us in New York and everyone was everywhere was shaken by that event. And I remember one of the things I remember thinking was, you know, how like all those people in the towers were just like, you know, going about their day and talking on the phone and doing this and that and the other thing. Then suddenly it was like over. And I just remember thinking, wow, you know, I, I was I was just on the phone with someone like that, you know, that November, let's say. And I noticed I had two kinds of phone calls too. I had certain phone calls, the phone would ring, and they say it's so-and-so, and I'd be like, happy, oh, so-and-so's called. And I'd like, I'd lean back, I'd talk on the phone, and I just would feel happy. I'm not necessarily friends with all these people. I don't say, like, how's your dog, and I don't golf with any of these people. I barely go out to lunch or dinner with them. I don't do any of those things you're supposed to do. But I just like, you know, it's just nice to talk to them on the phone. You can have a nice conversation about something. Then I have other uh, people, when I talk on the phone, my knuckle, I just would look at my hand after I got done talking. My knuckles were absolutely white. I just would have my fist clenched on the phone while I kind of like gritted my teeth and made it through this conversation. And I remember thinking, boy, if it could just end at any second, I, please, God, don't let me be talking to some asshole on the phone when it happens, you know, with my fist clenched and, go, and like have it all end at that moment. So I thought, you know, I'm going to progressively get rid of all these bad clients and replace them all with good clients. And I swear to God, I just like bared down and I just started saying, I put people on my watch list. I said I wouldn't work with these people anymore. And I started just kind of like actively kind of profiling people as they came in. And so, um, that, and that, if you force yourself to do that, it actually works. You can't be too picky. Um, you know, you can't just demand that, you know, uh, that you just want to only work for people to let you do whatever you want or that will let you do whatever you want and pay you enormous amounts of money. Uh, those things uh, seldom go hand in hand. But I think um, if you just really think about the, what you enjoy doing in, from day to day and sort of like try to just do more of that and less of the other kind, you can actually shift it a little bit. So, I mean, I said what I thought a, a good client is they've got brains, passion, trust, and courage. You know, what I think we owe them as designers is loyalty, honesty, dedication, tenacity. Loyalty in that um, my favorite clients, um, if they, I basically would do anything they asked me to do. Um, they don't ask me to do horrible things that much, but if they say, we need you to do this thing, we need you to do it for free, I'll do it. Um, if they say, we need you to do it, we need you to do it for this much money, I'll do that. You know, there's certain clients where I'll just sort of like do whatever they want and I'll do my best for it. Um, honesty, sometimes um, with all my favorite clients, though, I'll, I won't hesitate to say several things. Uh, I won't hesitate to say, this project you're proposing, are you sure you want to do it? It sounds like a lot of money to spend on something that actually won't help you that much. And here's something you could do that would cost less that would actually be um, potentially more effective. Um, that's actually a stunning thing to say to someone, by the way. Even if, I'll say that even to potential clients. If I'm interviewing for a job, I'll say, why do you want to do this? You're, you know, you want to replace this thing you've got with this new thing and pay me to do it? But what's wrong with the thing you've got? It doesn't seem that bad to me. People are like, I, I guess people don't hear that that much. I, I do it a lot, though. 
you guys can do it a lot too, then they'll hear it more, I suppose. But right now I seem to have the market cornered on, oh, really, you want to do this job? Why? You know? um, so um, it, I know, I can, it works for me. But the, the, that kind of honesty really works. Also, the kind of honesty that, I've, that I really admire, and I've worked with some really good architects and I've seen them do this, and it's sort of as stunning, is that thing that you accepted we did last week that is good, we came up with a better way to do it, and I want to show you what it is. Um, you know, or go all the way. I, my favorite clients, I've said to them, um, uh, you know, I know the meeting's tomorrow. I'm not sure that I've got the solution. And so what I'm going to do is just bring in what I've got, put it on the table, and, you know, just see whether or not between all of us we can look at the table and figure out, you know, some path through that. Believe me, there, you know, certain clients that I've worked with, that would be, they would freak out so much their heads would explode and it would be stuck to every wall of the room. Um, but my favorite clients are sort of like, they, they actually enjoy that as long as they're prepared, you know, you know. And sometimes I'll say, oh, I've got something that's really good. I'm, I'm gonna only show you one thing and I think it's great, but um, you know, if you don't like it, I'll come back and come up with another thing. So we'll do it like different ways. But be, that kind of honesty actually is, freaks some people out, but the best people it actually inspires. Dedication, you know, I think that's the thing, you know, I'll go back and I'll do it 20 more times if I have to, and that's tenacity too. So, um, so here's the trick though. Once you find one of these great clients, one that you really like and who likes you, just never let them go. Just hang on to them with all your might. Now that doesn't mean that you, they can't work with other people. It's not, this isn't monogamy we're talking about or you know, some kind of mutual slavery. Um, but I think you should really make sure that they can, that you have a good relationship with them and they continue to trust you. In fact, one of the things that I do with all my favorite clients is I, with every single one of them, I've said at one time or another, you know, the thing you're describing, I might not be the best person to do and here's someone I can think of who might do it better. That's another stunning thing they're not used to hearing and believe me, it, you know, if you, I mean, you can't fake the sincerity. Well, if you can't, if you can fake sincerity, you've got to made, as they always say. But, um, but you know, if, um, uh, um, that kind of honesty actually really is a trust building thing, particularly if you mean it. And I remember one time early on when I was having my early epiphanies, I did this job for my brother Don, who is a um, civil engineer in Cleveland. I designed a logo for him and his partners. That was like not an easy job. But I remember I just was like absolutely, you know, I didn't have to clear my throat and present and act like, you know, Mr. Designer. I was his brother, you know, we grew up together, um, you know, like, like brothers do. And so I just kind of said, you know, here's this one, it looks like this, here's this other one, it looks like that. And he would say, well, why can't that one? I said, oh, Don, you know, if you did that, you know, I just had this conversation. I remember like being done with it and thinking, oh, you know, if I could just like talk that way to all my clients, it would be like interesting, you know, instead of kind of clearing my throat and kind of couching everything in, in the kind of bullshit that I've heard in meeting after meeting. So I just started like doing that as well. And it sort of works. And, and you do get dedicated clients who will stick with you for a long time. And, and I remember nearly 20 years ago saying to one of my partners, Paula Cher, we were both talking about projects we loved and different, we're both connoisseurs of clients. We both are, you know, she, she, and if you ever read, um, uh, you know, she got that book, Make It Bigger, Paula does. She's got a passage in there about working at CBS Records and about a client she had at CBS Records who was there briefly and was one of these amazing people who just arrived, commissioned all this amazing work, got it all done, was able to cut through all the BS and somehow made everything possible and then left. And you can really tell it was just about this person being there. It wasn't about philosophy, merit, design quality, um, Paula's persuasiveness. It had to do with the enabling factor of this other human being being there in the room. And I remember both of us agreeing that if we could get five people like that in our lives, in our professional lives, we'd have it made. We just would be set. All I want is five. And I think, you know, at that point she had three and I had two, one and a half maybe. And I just kept thinking, I just need, you know, three and a half more and I'd be all set. Um, and so, um, I'm really lucky now. I, off the top of my head, as when I was getting ready for this, I uh, came up with ten clients that I would qualify as great favorite clients, and um, uh, that, I, I'll end just by saluting these ten that I came up with. There are others that I could name, but these are the ten that I came up with. And there's something interesting about them because they, uh, some of them go way back, um, and these people, most of whom you've never heard of, are the only reason that. Tina invited me to speak tonight, or this morning. Wow. Uh, <laughs> um, 
Tina invited me to speak uh, to you, all of you this morning on Friday morning, creatively. Um, you know, these are the people that were why I'm here. These are the people that are really responsible for some of the work that I, I'm just going to show you a couple pictures from each of them. And they, if it wasn't for them, those pictures would not exist. So um, Fern Malice, who I started working with in 1981, who here wasn't born in 1981? Ah! Uh, hey, Fern was the one who threw out the fake tree way back when. And she was the uh, uh, director of the CF, the Council of Fashion Designers of America. She's in charge of the fashion show Seventh on Six. You might have seen her on TV as one of the guest judges on Project Runway. That's uh, Fern. Uh, Rosalie Ginevro is the executive director of the Architectural League of New York. She's the one who, when and I do all my work for them pro bono. That's no guarantee that anything will be any easier. Have you, any of you guys noticed that? You know, I'll do it for free. You know, there's, oh, the, yeah, yeah, the meter's not going to run and I can still take a ride? Yeah, well, where do you want to go? Let's just drive all over the place. No. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so Rosalie is great, and I've done, I've, I've literally worked with them now for 25 plus years um, and not made a um, penny, but had gotten so much pleasure out of it. And she can tell you, um, uh, you know, how honest we are with each other. Um, the architect Bob Stern, who you probably have heard of, I met back when I was working for Massimo, and I've done everything for him from books to town planning signage to posters, all kinds of different things. Uh, Terry Schaefer, who I met back at the end of my tenure at Vignelli, has had a number of different jobs. He worked for Brookstone, and he worked for a couple of department stores, but he finally ended up at Saks Fifth Avenue, called me up and said, I've got a really cool job for you, designing our, redesigning our packaging. And this is, this is one of those clients where we worked for, I think, two months and had nothing, just had nothing. And w came into a meeting and just threw things on a table and said, you know, I don't think we're there yet. What, is there anything you see here that makes any sense at all? And he picked out a couple of things that led to that solution. Um, Laura Shore, a lot of you might know, she's the director of marketing at Mohawk Paper. She's one of my all-time favorite clients, uh, and I've done a bunch of different publications that she was indul you know, indulged my interest in. Uh, through the years, and she's also one of those people who works with a lot of good designers, and I, when she calls me up and says, I want you to do this job, I really know that it's important to her and that she, she's thought it through and has decided that I'm the best person to do it for whatever reason, and I take that very, very seriously because she knows what she's doing. She Perlman, some of you might know she was the um, um, executive director of ID Magazine for years, but was a writer there before and is like a writer now. And every once in a while she does projects and she'll call me up. She just did this the night before last. I've never made a penny off of Chi to my knowledge. And, uh, but it's always an interesting project. This was a thing we did at Parsons. She organized where they took those voting booths from uh, the 2000 election in Palm Beach County and had artists just kind of do things to them. So we designed that exhibit and the catalog for it. And she just asked me to do a, 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 another project the other night that sounds like it'll be potentially a harrowing uh, pain, but very gratifying, and I will never say no to Chi. Jody Friedman is, uh, works at Princeton University. I've done everything for her from big capital campaigns that I had no experience doing. I didn't go to Princeton, and I, um, uh, when she called me up the first time, I said, Jody, I didn't, she went to Princeton. I said, I didn't go to anything like Princeton. I said, you know who went to Princeton is Bill Drantel. And so why don't you call up Bill and Stephen Doyle and have them do it? And she did, and she visited them. And then she came back and said, I'd still like you to try this. So, and I said, but I didn't go to, she knows now I didn't go to Princeton, although I almost have gone to Princeton at this point. And I'm, you know, everything from hats to banners. Um, David Thurm was, is the, um, was uh, until recently the chief financial officer at the New York Times, and he was the guy that said, you know, we should have a really neat sign on this building. And he was the one who said, Michael, do you really think it'll work to chop up the logo and do it like this? And I said, David, I really, I think it'll work, but I don't know. I don't think we'll know for sure until we put it up there. And he said, okay. You know, so he was with the... <laughs> And he was also, uh, he also kept saying, can't we do something neat with all these boring signs? And I said, and I came up with an idea, I said, this will be complicated, but it might be worth it. And a lot of people would hear complicated and say, um, we'll get back to on that. And David said, no, let's do it. And so, you know, every sign inside the Times building is different. Um, and it's all, each one has a photograph that we found, a different, one of 800 different photographs that we found in their archives. For, so every men's room sign has a different picture of men. Every women's room sign has a different picture of women. Every copy room sign has different things that have to do with people copying, and they don't have any balcony signs, but um, every balcony sign has a pope on it or something. 
and that was because of David. Uh, John Tag is um, uh, was the head of marketing, and now he's the president of United Airlines. And e example of the kind of guy who, after a dozen meetings um, in uh, in a big corporation like that, will kind of come in and look at a design and say, "Well, why don't we just paint the planes to look like that? What else do we have to do?" And you know, everyone writes down paint planes. Okay, so now. You know, so thank you, John Tague. And uh, Chrissy McLear, who's like uh, one of the newest clients, is the executive director of the Philip Johnson Glass House up in New Canaan, Connecticut. If you get a chance to go there, go there. It's a great, great place. And she is so energetic. She, you say, yes, I'll do it before you can figure out how fast she needs it done or how little she can pay. And it's always worth it. And so we've done everything from, you know, the website to um, printed stuff to uh, with my partner Jim Bieber, a visitor center up there in downtown New Canaan. Well worth a visit if you ever get there. Uh, Philip Johnson was good with clients too, by the way. If you ever read any of his interviews, um, he was great with clients. And he was also one of those guys who quoted, uh, um, you know, I think it was H.H. Uh, Richardson, the architect, who was asked the first principle of architecture, which is get the job. Uh, and there's a whole other presentation you do about how you get a job. I'll do some other time. So once I started naming these 10 clients, I could go even further, but I won't because uh, the time is limited. We want to go to questions. So, you know, that the first question, you know, th these are, you know, there's that song, um, uh, um, Don't You Want Somebody to Love, you know, by uh, um, Jefferson Airplane, Janis Joplin. Don't you want somebody to love? Don't you need somebody to love? So somewhere out there, there's a, just, a client just for you, so you better find somebody to love and good luck. All right. Wow. <laughs> wow, I can only imagine how many hits this video is gonna get once we put it up on Vimeo. Um, this was amazing, thank you, Michael. We have, we're just gonna squeeze in some time for questions. And actually, the first two questions Michael has a, uh, has a surprise for. So, who wants to start? We're singing now. <laughs> Michael is just going to repeat the questions, so speak loud. Okay. The surprise isn't unpleasant or embarrassing, it's, it's, so don't be afraid to ask a question. I have a question. Oh, go ahead. All right. Um, you blew my mind on the educating the client. Yeah. Um, it's, well, part of, you know, you know, if someone actually is like begging me to explain it to them, I'll do it. I'd sort of, if they're, you know, what the kind of educating the client I don't like is, you know, we have this dumb client they need to be fixed and what we need to do is educate them to make them into a good client. Um, the thing, what I've found, I, what I've, what I've done, I learned this trick early on is, um, if you actually acquaint yourself with the content, and I'm guessing as an exhibit designer, that goes without saying, but you'd be surprised how many designers you learn where, and I was one of these designers too. I thought the content, if I was given some book to design, I thought the content was, you know, um, you know, uh, 55 rectangular shapes of different sizes and 3,000 words that said something, and my job was to take those shapes and those words and have them fit on, you know, um, 160 pages and uh, have every page kind of look cool and find an interesting way to do the page numbers, you know. And, um, and of course, that's like, that's just like, if you, if you think that way, you're kind of like, and it's, you have to know how to do that, by the way, but if that's what you're interested in, that's what you think design is, that's sort of giving up the most fun part of uh, um, of the design process. Oh, thanks for turning up those lights. Um, and so what I found though is what I started doing this trick where I'd kind of become familiar with the content, particularly reading the text they would give me all the way through. And I can't tell you how many meetings I've gone into since where they'll say, you know, so you'll have, you'll be presenting a design and they'll say, um, and, and I'll say something like, and you'll notice here on page uh, seven, we've introduced this other, uh, uh, we kind of changed up the design a little bit, reflecting the fact that you're switching at this moment from the 
discussion of the this to the discussion of the other thing, uh, as you are in your text, it's on your page 23. And you'll see, everyone, no one's read the text. No one has any idea that, you know, they're, they're even worse than you are sometimes. So you immediately get this leg up, and then they're one step behind for the rest of the meeting, you know, trying to like, oh, I wish I would have read whatever it is we were making you design, but none of them did because they didn't have time. <laughs> Um, and so um, I think um, people love talking about themselves. If you read um, um, Dale Carnegie's How to Win Friends and Influence People, I mean, that's one of the principles. They just love talking about themselves. They love talking about what they're interested in. And it's usually not hard to get them to talk about that, particularly with exhibit design. I know that part of the tr problem with exhibit designers sometimes is uh, there's an overemphasis on, um, on everyone's kind of specialized uh, expertise. And um, you know, there'll be all this kind of received wisdom, like type has to be this big, or if you, you know, you can only, you know, you have to do three to seven of these things. You can't have two or eight stuff like that. I imagine, right? And, and so I think a lot of times it's just a matter of, um, of the, I mean, my, my favorite exhibits and yours too, probably, are ones where you could tell that everyone just had a real passion about the subject matter. And in fact, you don't see the design when you're there. The subject matter, the the content is actually just coming through. So I think if everyone just kind of focuses on the content, it lets you sidestep both style questions on one hand and technical questions on the other. I don't think you can do it entirely, and it's never, you know, I can't say that I go every day of the year without ever talking about those things, but I sort of do everything I can just to uh, um, keep, the, keep the conversation happening about, you know, what normal people are going to see when they look at the thing you're designing. They're not going to see typefaces. They're not going to see the strategy. They'll see whatever the evidence is right um, in front of them, you know, whether it's an exhibit or a brochure or a website, whatever it is. Um, for your question, you don't have to get it now, but uh, I will give you a copy of my rapidly aging book, 79 Short Essays on Design, and if you want, I'll sign it for you, okay? So that's what you do. Just come down afterwards and get it, okay? Who has another question and who doesn't have that book and wants a copy of it? <laughs> yeah, oh, right there. I'm sorry, say the question again? Um, the question is, have I ever been able to turn a bad client into a good client? I'm going to be pessimistic and say, first say no. However, I remember one time meeting this guy who um, I could tell right away was just a stupendous, and I'll use the word I used in describing him, asshole. Not him. I didn't say you're a stupendous asshole. But like, I, I remember saying afterwards, I said, this job is really interesting, and I'm going to try something different this time. Instead of thinking I love this client and learning, you know, the worst ones are when you're tricked. You know, when it's like, you know, the brutal ones are when you're really excited about a project, really like the people, then they turn into monsters on you. So if the question is, can you turn a, a bad client into a good client? Um, probably not. But what you can do is, um, um, is do something where you're able to somehow uh, anticipate what's, you know, tap what the good part of them and use that to everyone's advantage sometimes. So I remember this guy who we thought was a tremendous jerk. Um, I actually ended up really kind of falling in love with, actually, just because he was so predictably um, um, awful. It was just sort of like funny, and I just kind of like learned not to take him seriously, and he sort of like ended up sort of respecting us a little bit more because of that. And so there's that. Then I've, I've had like another kind of client where they're not necessarily particularly smart, but they're like this kind of person who, once they understand that, um, uh, once they understand like a rule, they just stick to that rule no matter what. And if you sort of understand that kind of client, I don't think that's a particularly good client, but you can, you know, if you can kind of like fix it so that you make sure that whatever it is they understand it kind of gets everyone going in the right direction. You know, someone who can walk through walls for you is actually a useful thing to have. They won't help you get to heaven, but they will help you kind of like get through some barriers just because we all agreed in the meeting in February that everything will be this PMS color. You know, you just make sure it's the right PMS color before you set this robot in, in, on, in motion because they're, they are like the Terminator. They don't understand anything. That's what they do. They make everything that PMS color, you know. Um, uh, but um, but so, like, I wouldn't call, it's not necessarily a good client, but sometimes you can take a bad client and kind of use them for good purposes in a way, right? And you get a book too, okay? I'll give it to you now. Um, there are no more books. I'll give my jacket. No, it's a... Uh, my shoes, uh, but I will answer any other questions. Okay, yell it out.
So the question is, um, you know, there are clients that actually are just, um, uh, yeah, it's, it's, and tell me if I'm paraphrasing this correctly. You know, you have clients where they just kind of keep insisting on certain things that they have to have, and they can be frustrating, and do I get clients that frustrate me in that way that I just can't take it anymore? And, you know, the answer is yes, actually. Um, and uh, one, th you know, if, if one thing I didn't write down, and I meant to write it down or project it on, uh, uh, on the screen, is the biggest favor you can do yourself is to try as long as possible, as much as possible, to be in a position that you can walk away from things that you don't like, that you don't have to take every job, then if a job starts going the wrong way, you can walk away from it. I don't do it that often, but every once in a while, I'll sort of reach a point with a client where I say, look, you know, and I, and I don't say, you know, I, I'm not, it's not my way to say I hate you, I quit, but I'll say something like, look, I, you know, this seemed like a good idea at the beginning, but I think, and I think you might agree that this marriage isn't perfect, and I think maybe it's not that I'm not a uh, uh, that you're not, you know, a nice person, that I'm not trying hard, but I think somehow we're just not connecting the right way. And, um, and so maybe as opposed to investing more time in something that's not going to end well, why don't we go our separate ways? And in fact, I can give you some names of some people that now with my knowledge of what it is you seem to want, might be able to fulfill your needs better than, um, better than me. Um, so um, for one, a couple of interesting things happen when you do that. Uh, the client often freaks out. You know, they just, you know, they were ready for anything, not being fired by the designer. You know, that sort of is like the last thing they were expecting. And then sometimes they actually, a, a few times I've done that and they were like completely surprised. They had no idea anything was wrong. And they're like, oh really? You know, they, and then, you know, they've gotten concerned. They say, well, let's no, let's make this work. We like working with you, let's make this work. So sometimes it's a wake up call, which is great. Um, sometimes, um, at least one time, it made a client so mad that he um, wrote me this like crazy girlfriend letter that it was like this, it was a single space letter that went on for two pages about how awful I was and how he would never work with me ever, ever again. And he never has worked with me ever again. And I, and I didn't, and, and I, 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 um, I, and I had one orientation meeting with this guy, realized that I didn't want to ever go back and meet with him again and just said, you know, I don't think this is, I don't think we're right for each other. You know, um, I don't, it, rather than investing more time, I, I just didn't want to present an idea to this guy. I could just tell it would be bad. And, but boy, was he mad. Um, but um, but some, it can go a lot of different ways, actually. So that's a luxury you have to be prepared to do. And, um, and also, I think that, um, again, I'm always fascinated by clients that are obsessed with having certain, you know, they have to have it be a certain way. Uh, for whatever reason. And one of the things I try to do is figure out, well, what is it about that certain way that they like so much, you know? Um, and, and if you sort of play it the right way, it's like um, Iron Chef, you know, where they, you know, um, here's like a kumquat and a, uh, uh, a jar of peanut butter and um, some whipped cream. Make something good out of this, you know? Sometimes they say, here's a horrible typeface and this stupid PMS color and this uh, dumb logo. Can you make something nice out of that? Sometimes the answer is no when you say, I prefer not to. Um, uh, but I know someone who can, and then you find someone you particularly dislike, and you kind of give them your phone number. Um, but then other times, you, you know, it's an interesting challenge, actually. I find that a lot of times, um, uh, um, I, I actually, these days I tend to do more and respond more enthusiastically if I have some interesting limitations. Um, these blue sky things, and I've always said that to, for instance, Laura Shore at Mohawk Paper, I hate these kind of, do something pretty so it'll make the paper look good things. I just sort of can't, I don't have ideas for that. I sort of have to come up with some real, I have to invent a problem that will solve what the thing we're doing that imposes limitations on it. So I can't say I mind limitations, and uh, they can be good, but I think, uh, sometimes you just realize that it's just not meant to be, and um, you can either play that all the way through and hope that you get paid in the end, or you can um, walk away in the middle, risking the fact that you might get, not get paid for anything you've done. But every time I've done it, I sort of come to the point where I said, I, I don't care, I just don't, I, I'll pay that much money to be released from this uh, relationship, I just can't take it anymore. Um, Tina, that was the last question, right? Okay.